welcome to the 406th edition of the Business of Story. I'm your host, Park Howell. Today, you'll meet an ad agency owner and his new business mentor who inspired him to evolve his generalist agency into one that is focused on a brilliant market segment. Because, as you'll hear, the riches are in the niches. My good friend Greg Head, a guru in the startup and high-tech marketing world and host of the Practical Founders podcast, says that specialists eat generalists for lunch. I've seen that in my own work from running my ad agency, Park & Co., as a generalist agency back in the late 1990s and then finding a core niche of sustainable marketing starting in 2008. But my services became laser-focused in 2016 when now all I do is consult, teach, coach, and speak internationally on the power of storytelling in business leadership. In fact, my tagline is to help you as a leader excel through the stories you tell. The wise old master that helped me position my ad agency back in the early 2000s and who I've learned from right up through the positioning of Business of Story is Michael Gass of Fuel Lines, who is with us today. He has been helping agencies internationally find their focus purpose through his company, Fuel Line. And make no mistakes, if you are flailing about trying to increase your revenue, it's probably because you do not have a focused brand story. When I'm working with an agency, we do a a full day workshop where I share with them the strategies, tactics, and tools. And the afternoon, in about two and a half hours, we have the positioning exercise, which everybody gets really nervous. Like, we haven't figured out our positioning in years. How are we going to do it in a two and a half hour period? I've done this with so many agencies. We've never failed to walk away with a great positioning and with a very specific target. That's actually where I start in the conversation. The first thing we do is identify the target. Michael had the same impact on Rand Jenkins, a co-founder and director of marketing strategy for Mountain Mojo, which is a Flagstaff, Arizona-based agency whose core focus is now helping independent family-owned hardware stores be successful in the highly competitive market dominated by big box retailers. It started us in the refining process of becoming more discerning as an agency and and trying to identify the traits for some of our clients, both from a culture standpoint and also from a revenue standpoint and deliverables, the, the traits that were most attractive to us so that if we were to choose a vertical, which one would it be? And, uh, and slowly we, you know, whittled it down into hardware and we've been uh, focused on that probably for about two years now. But this year is when we've finally started to drive specifically only within that vertical. Today, you'll learn how Rand has carved out his unique niche and hear from Michael as I host a remarkable Q&A between these two pros so you can leverage their insights into growing your own market-focused company. Because as you know, the riches are found in the niches. Hey, Rand, welcome to the show. Hey, Park, thanks for having me. And I got to start by giving you a big congratulations on your building purchase. You are moving your agency into your own place up in Flagstaff, Arizona. We are. We're, we're very excited. We're finally going to have that that dog park in the on premise that we've always wanted. So we're we're pretty pumped up. Really? So it's the dog park that was your impetus, huh? A good part of it. I think that there's probably some financial decisions there. You know, <laughs> hopefully gain to gain some equity over the years. But definitely, we wanted control over our space so that we could kind of allow some of our culture to evolve into the walls and the yard and some of the office spaces and those types of things that we never had control over before. Well, I can't wait to see it. When do you guys think you'll be in there? It should be about six weeks of construction for phase one, and then Mm -hmm. we'll move in, hopefully mid-April, right by, by the time for our quarterly pulsing we're hoping to have there. And then, you know, over the next couple of years, the the campus will evolve through a few phases. And then um, probably maybe five to 10 years in, we'll start to 
talk about expansion. It's a it's a pretty big lot, so we're going to try and add as many business type uh, units on there as possible. Well, that's great. And your agency is Mountain Mojo. For all of our listeners out there that don't know of Mountain Mojo out of Flagstaff, Arizona, tell us a little bit about your shop. Perfect. So we're your regular old full service marketing agency, and we focus on three things as far as deliverables go: websites, uh, brand kits, or you know logo packages, and then uh, retained services. And then under our retained services. Uh, you know, we offer everything from, you know, paid ads and social and PR and dev and design and all those things. But I'd say that our biggest differentiator is mostly just the fact that we're very strategic in our execution. You know, we're balanced between data and creativity and that, um, yeah, we, we really love what we do and who we do it with. And that really helps to uh, show in the work that we create and helps us with retention of our clients. We've had our clients for a long, long time, and we're hoping to keep it that way. Now, you're in Flagstaff, which is about two hours north of Phoenix, for those that don't know out there. It is home for Northern Arizona University, which is really quite a large institution. I think where they got 23, 24,000 students there. That always surprises people when I tell them that. But other than that, there's not a lot of industry, per se, in Flagstaff, other than tourism and, and, and that sort of thing. Where do you find your business in a small market like that? That's a great question. When we first started, you know, the, the good news about a small market is that they're pretty connected with one another. And so it didn't take us long to be able to network our way into some local clients. Uh, but then as we've started to to grow the team and our expertise and kind of the depth of our services, we started to expand outside of Flagstaff. So now we're offering our services to at least half of, I think, our clients now are, are outside of Flagstaff. And so um, the geography really is more about the lifestyle of the team that we have. Everybody is in Flagstaff, but then it is about, you know, trying to, uh, to recruit new clients. Absolutely. And you've been a fixture in Flagstaff for quite a long time. Why don't you give us your backstory of how you found yourself up here in the mountain town, now splitting time with Phoenix, Arizona, and you weren't in the ad world initially. Tell us that. Give us, give us your journey, if you would. Yeah, it's almost like I, I backed into it um, accidentally. So, you know, in the early, late, the late 90s, I moved out from Florida to Arizona, dropped out of college, moved out to live on the Grand Canyon or the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And when I was out there, um, Flagstaff's only about an hour and a half away from the South side. So we would hike through and then we'd drive down and I always loved Flagstaff. And so sure enough, a few years after I moved back to Florida, I decided I'd wanted to live in Flagstaff. So I came out in 05. I made beer. I owned part of a um, Arizona's first distillery I, uh, you know, was a bouncer for a while and slowly evolved bar back and bartender. Wait, wait, whoa, then, whoa, 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 whoa. You, calm, ran, was a bouncer? I can't even picture you throwing someone out into a street. You know, most of the time you don't throw them. <laughs> uh, it's mostly carrying. It, and uh, <laughs> usually, you know, you outnumber them. Uh, but when you are working a solo shift, you do have to be cool and calm and hopefully have uh, a little bit of smooth talking to you. It's Otherwise, you get in trouble. You can get in some pretty big trouble. we got some great stories over the I, years. It's I bet you crazy. do. Okay, sorry to interrupt. I just didn't know that about you. So please continue. Yeah. Well, so I, I had the, the fortune to be able to um, buy the, the bar and the brewery that I was working at when I moved out there in 08. And so we converted it into a music venue. And that kind of got me into, you know, the world of production, which I had a little bit of experience in, but it also got me into um, the need to not just guerrilla market, you know, throwing posters up on, on phone poles, but also uh, digital marketing. And so, you know, right around 08 is when social started to hit pretty good. And so I started to learn marketing, but really from a, a more of a hustle standpoint than a, like a structured what most people would go to school for marketing. And then uh, in 2010, I started my first festival. And so, uh, and we subsequently had three other or three total festivals over the next eight years. And so a majority of my marketing experience was, was literally just, you know, experimental. 
and relying on you know other professionals around me that could help me to sell tickets and to sell beer and uh, and try and get people to come out to events. So that was the background. But in 2015, I was really burnt out, so I sold my venue and uh, started what we thought would just be a little digital marketing agency, and we would help with some social media. And I actually partnered with the guy who ran the print shop who printed all of the posters for all the shows. And uh, so him and I, you know, figured we could, we were, we were pretty good at social. He could build kind of a website and he was a pretty good designer. So we figured we'd start up an agency and figure it out along the way. And now how many people do you have working for you? So there's 11 of us total now. We'll probably hit another hiring cycle here in the next, in at the end of Q2. But yeah, we're growing. We grew a little bit too quick a few years ago. And so we, you know, we've expanded and contracted and now we're ready to, to expand again, but we're, we're doing it very slowly and cautiously now, instead of trying to, to hire quickly and, and onboard as many clients as possible, humans and clients, we're a little bit more focused on process and just extending that lead time a little bit more. We're a little less desperate having to close a client and start them right away. But yeah, so we should be, you know, somewhere between 15, 18 in the next couple of years, but we won't, we probably won't outgrow, you know, 25 or 30. Well, you say that now until this new niche, well, newish niche, you guys have been working at it for a little while. This idea about representing independent mom and pop, for lack of a better term, hardware stores around the country. And Mountain Mojo and you and your team and Austin and the gang there have really done a nice job of carving out this niche. What made you go to that particular niche in the industry? And after you finish that question, we are going to bring in an expert that you know well, who is all about niching ad agencies. So how how this whole niche come about? Well, I, I hate to spoil the the plot, but um, you know, we were at a conference, a mastermind conference with other agency owners in Jacksonville. I want to say it was four or five years ago. We heard someone speak there and they specifically spoke about verticals, which we had no idea what they were, and about um how powerful being able to niche down um, can be for an agency owner on so many levels. And that was really attractive for us. And we were still trying to get our legs under us at that point, but but it was something that it was a powerful seed that was planted. Um, you know, and then we we read an expertise book by a, a guy that's got a, a two bobs podcast. And um uh, and between those two things, it was really it started us in the refining process of becoming more discerning as an agency and and trying to identify the traits for some of our clients both from a culture standpoint and also from a revenue standpoint and deliverables of, of the, the traits that were most attractive to us so that if we were to choose a vertical, which one would it be? And, uh, and slowly we, you know, whittled it down into hardware and we've been uh, focused on that probably for about two years now, but this year is when we've finally started to drive specifically only within that vertical. Excellent. So with that, I would love to welcome to the show my good friend and a, a gentleman, a professional who helped me niche my agency way, way, way back in the 2000 and aughts, Michael Gass of Fuel Alliance. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, Park. Good to be with you. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. I was Hello, Rand. Of- hey, Michael. <laughs> I was out in Birmingham, your hometown, about, what, a month or so ago, working with uh, Southern nu- Southern Nuclear on business storytelling. And gosh, Michael, it was so great to get back together with you. We had dinner. We covered a lot of ground over dinner. And I had mentioned Rand and the work that they were doing there. And Rand, I totally forgot that it was Michael that kicked you into gear in the first place in that Jacksonville, <laughs> Florida conference. Do you remember that show, Michael? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> It was, a it was a loaded with ad agencies out there, and they're just trying to figure <laughs> out how to position themselves. <laughs> like most. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this 17 years, and uh, it, it amazed me as a uh, new business consultant to advertising agencies. And I built a business um, not only across the United States, but Canada and, and also in Europe. 
and all the agencies are pretty much in the same boat. They are in a perpetual state of rebranding. And uh, a lot of that due to the fact that they have no target audience. And they wouldn't allow their clients to get, get around that. It's kind of marketing 101. But for an ad agency, they have such a difficult time. All they think about is missed opportunities, uh, the tighter their niche would be. And I've always shared that, you know, the riches are in the niches. And when you think of the power of a niche and how you can build an agency like Rand has done that gives people an excuse well outside of his market that creates an appeal and a positioning of expertise and uh, to be able to do that pretty quickly. And then, uh, you know, you you have that appeal to a larger audience than trying to be a generalist. And so, Rand, why the hardware business? Were you already representing a few hardware stores and flagstaff in the area? And you said, hey, this is an underrepresented clientele. We can do this. Or how did it come about? Well, you know, that's a, a good question. The, the, the filtering, it doesn't seem like was overly intentional at first. You know, once we had, once Michael had planted the seed, we were just trying to figure out, you know, what made sense to sustain the business, right? We wanted the business to be able to live. And so that led us to, to the revenue conversation. But at the end of the day, once we got our legs under us and we're like, okay, we're going to do this, we were much more comfortable. And that's when we, you know, we had a really strong, we're an EOS shop. So we had a really strong understanding of our core values. And in that alignment, we figured out that, you know, the, whoever it is that we work with has to have three things. And we still use this to, you know, every prospect that I interview on a daily basis. They have to be kind, first and foremost. They have to be collaborative, meaning that they don't just expect us to do everything. And we don't, you know, lean on them to make all the decisions either, that it's very collaborative. And then the third thing is that they're locally owned and operated. And we realized that there was a handful of our clients that, that checked all those boxes. And then we realized from a revenue standpoint, what our minimum retainer would have to be and who could support that and what their revenue would have to be as far as a marketing percentage spend goes. And it, it just happened to be, you know, one of our favorite clients anyways. And so we asked them for some introductions and to better understand the industry and the potential. And then, you know, we started reading all the McKenzie reports and everything else about the future of the industry and how much potential there is. And it just made more and more and more sense that the deeper we got into it. Michael, it sounds like they did everything about right. Uh, they sure did. And so many agencies out there uh, are trying to be everything to everybody that they don't appeal to anybody. And congratulations to Rand to, you know, get that target audience. You know, new business doesn't have to be this hard. Most agencies struggle with it. But, you know, you've got to give prospects, if you want to create business well beyond your market, you've got to give, give them a reason why they fly over hundreds of other agencies that want to do business with you. When you create that niche, find that target. And, um, you know, when I was doing this, uh, I was helping ad agencies switch from more of an outbound new business program to more of an inbound. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to create a niche blog. And in practicality, when agencies are in this perpetual state of rebranding, they're also in a perpetual state of redesigning their websites. So we created the niche blog offsite and built it around the agency owner as the face of the agency or owners to provide more of an emotional connection. And two, you know, the, the agency is almost a representative of their personal brand. I mean, it's their culture, their vision, and they're in practicality, the least likely person to leave. So building it around the agency owner, and then it allowed us to drill down much, much further than they were uh, willing to do on the website. And when you would pick a target, it allowed you to use this as the gateway, the top of a funnel for a very specific target group that you actually wanted them to go through that niche blog first. And you're creating content, things of value, becoming a resource uh, to that specific target. And it goes back to my days as a cold caller 
I always in the back of my mind, people wanted to work with other people that they know, trust, and like. And in the early days of social media, when I initially started my blog back in 2007, I based it a lot on that premise. And I found that utilizing social media inbound marketing would help me to create networks of prospective clients so much faster than I could uh, just face to face. Uh, When I started my consultancy, it was above my garage in Alabaster, Alabama. I was not known outside of the two markets that I'd worked in pretty much my whole ad career. And uh, I'm sitting on the West Coast in four months after uh, launching my, my blog, my niche blog on fueling ad agency new business. I'm in the in a uh, with an agency working on the West Coast in Costa Mesa, California. And I'm thinking, what would it have taken using traditional marketing methods to, you know, have this opportunity? So that coupled with social media just propelled me to be able to work with over 450 agencies, helping them create their niche, uh, helping them to create this um, blog, build their online community of prospects. And particularly, you know, when content, everybody got on social media, most agencies finally relented. And in about 2015, they started to participate. Then content marketing became very hot. Everybody's participating. You have such a gluttony of content now that, you know, to really break through, you've got to be positioned. You have to have a target audience and you have to speak directly to them to have any kind of a headway. It's not just checking off a box that we're a participant any longer. It's, you know, really creating content of value, but to a very specific target group. And let's talk about that for a second, because I was just on the call with a client just right before this, a gentleman that you're working with right now, also, Michael, and we were both sort of commiserating about the amount of content out there and how hard it is to break through. It's not like when you first started out working with agencies where this was all new, I mean, pioneering, and so you could get through a lot faster. We also know the paper play thing may work, may not work. Just read Bob Hoffman's book on ad scam. and It'll make you never, ever spend one single dollar again online. But Rand, what are you guys doing in that content world to stand out and to really build that niche around Mountain Mojo and the hardware business? Good question. So about three months ago, we, well, we spent the last year developing a community, an online community specifically for hardware retail, where we felt we could deliver the most value was to simply host and curate mastermind, like peer-to-peer mastermind groups. And so we created what's called what we called hardwareinnovators.com. And within that, we host uh, monthly masterminds for peer-to-peer, so owner-to-owner, GM-to-GM, B2B sales, B2B sales, and marketers-to-marketers. And uh, the community comes together, they share, you know, their wins, they share some of their challenges, and then we've created a Slack channel for them to be able to kind of share wins and challenges as well, real time. And so that's allowed us to help to both create content based on those conversations, which are, you know, real time challenges that people are facing and hopefully come up with the answers and solutions that, that then feed our blog, but also then just uh, really basic content because now we're sharing that there are events coming up, you know, and we're leveraging that as a way to brand ourselves. And then um, post events, you know, we share little snippets too, as far as what the big takeaways were. And so that content goes a long, long ways for people to be able to, to get more of that uh, four hour work week, kind of a, a news snippet without having to attend the meetings if they don't have the time or the patience. And then we started a, a 60 second hardware retail marketing tip, which we do every week. And so we threw that on LinkedIn, very basic way for our, you know, one of our social media creators to be able to take some of the wins that we see with our clients, with the hardware clients, and just communicate those very quickly, easy to digest. She's fantastic at it. And so that's helped us to, to kind of push that as well. But the whole content strategy itself is probably maybe 20 or 25 hours a month for us. And that's between 
four or five people. So it's very manageable, very easy to do. So you uh, <clears throat> essentially have built an ecosystem for your ideal client, customer to come in, commiserate with their peers. You then get intel on the industry, share out some of those findings with the rest of the world to attract more in and built it. It's a kind of a different content play, Michael, isn't it, than what you originally started with, with agencies when we were just writing blogs and pushing it out. This is seems like a much more sophisticated way of doing it. Right. It, it certainly is. And as the technology evolves, you know, podcasting now in the early days, there there wasn't much available. But now everybody's into podcasting where, again, you know, if you're going to really build an audience today, you can't be a generalist. You've got to be very specific to a target group and create that kind of content of value. And certainly Rand's found some ways to build. I mean, community development comes before business development and he's, he's done it right. And, um, you know, wherever that online community is, and then you start to become that uh, go-to resource for that particular target group. And, you know, you create that that trust and the likability and trust among, you know, that particular uh, target group goes just a long, long way. All right, Rand, I am going to step to the side. This is now your show. You have Michael Gass, one of the most brilliant positioners out there in the world. Go ahead. Ask him anything you want. I want to sit back and listen to this exchange. How can he help you build your business? I appreciate it. Thanks, Park. And yeah, Michael, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, and it's it's great to see you. You know, one of the big uh, issues that we're facing right now, or that you know, potentially for me, uh, you know, again through EOS as the visionary within our agency, is to try and make sure that I stay a few steps ahead of. And the Rand, team. can I ask you real quick, what sure. is EOS? I'm unfamiliar with that. So it's a, the entrepreneurial operating system, and so mm-hmm. it's a a, a process for both meetings and, you know, the identification of issues, the identification of goal set, like goal setting. And and I wish I had a better way to describe that, but there's a lot of businesses in the country that follow EOS and it just allows your business to have a process foundation and, um, and then be able to grow from there. And what it's done for us is really create a common language for us to all create or uh, communicate with. So yeah, there's a what they call an accountability chart, like an org chart for other people, and I sit in the seat uh, referred to as visionary, and uh, the visionary is in charge of um, you know trying to figure out what the next steps are for the agency. And so now that we've niched down and we're finding some success within that niche, we're trying to figure out how it is that we could potentially add another one. And I say that hopefully not prematurely, you know, hopefully this would be a couple of years from now, but trying to figure out how to take the processes that we've built in, you know, within this community that we're trying to establish and replicate it in another industry or vertical. And so I'm just curious, Michael, if you've had, if you've worked with someone who has added a second vertical, somebody who's niched that's added a second vertical and how it went or, you know, what that looks like, or if, if we should get that out of our heads because it's crazy or a you know, waste of time. But what do you think about that? We've certainly faced this issue before. I was working with an agency that was located in Manhattan and uh, it was a social media agency. And it's like, you know, guys, and this was kind of early on. And it's like, why am I here? And there were so many social media agencies, you know, in that discipline already that they found it to be a crowded field and, but they wanted to create multiple blogs right off the bat. And it's like, you know, this takes a lot of work and you need to develop all of your processes like uh, content development and the various kinds of content. You need to get a system down and do that specifically around usually a person so that that person gets positioned as being the expert. The agency uh, is more in the background. You don't, you're not selling the agency. You're selling solutions by really giving your thinking away, which is almost counterintuitive to most agencies. But that person gains that position and 
a lot through their writing. And I still believe in, in written content because that's all my, uh, that's almost like my continuing education program. If like AI right now is becoming a, a trend. Uh, so how is it going to affect agencies? That helps me to stay ahead of my audience and also, you know, in my sixties now to kind of be in a leadership role of how this is going to impact and and as I create that content, it helped me to assimilate that information quickly. But once you really mine that niche and you get that foundation and you're starting to generate a lot of new business opportunities, that new business pipeline is flowing well, and you want to create another niche, I would suggest doing that around another person, someone with a vested interest in the agency. I have an agency that actually started with millennialmarketing.com and the person around that whose father started the agency, Jeff Fromm, is the Barclay Agency in Kansas City. And, and Jeff started that, has had great success. And then they also created a niche blog a little later with someone with a vested interest in the agency that developed a niche for QSR restaurants to help replace the business that they lost when they lost the Sonic account. And uh, so they created another niche. And since these live off site, it doesn't create any confusion. You're building that positioning of expertise around a person or again or persons. And now they've just launched that. Well, uh, in, in recent years, they've launched their third uh, niche blog, which is specific to CPG companies. And, so again, there's no conflict or anything else. By having them live off site allows them room to breathe and grow. It builds it around that person, but we, we don't hide the connection to the agency. We just don't lead with it. So as that niche blog with that person being the representative and, and gaining that positioning in the profile section, it, it, speaks of their positioning within our position at the agency. And they'll go to the website and what they're looking for is, you know, does my perception of this person really match up with reality? And they do that through the website where there's case studies and where there's work to be shown and the kind of things that they're looking for to show that this person has also deep experience, you know, within that space. So, you know, that's a way I think to do it is to allow each of those niche blogs to live off site and um, their defenses aren't up as they would be coming directly to the website because the website's all about you. It's all about the agency. When you try to sell off the website, you know, again, their defenses are up. When you're creating content of value and those niche blogs, it's all about that prospective client. And that blog becomes a resource. Like you're talking about events, events for that particular category, that particular vertical, other thought leaders that are in that space, even your competitors. It allows you to really become such an added resource to your particular target group and they want to keep coming back. If they've read the brochure, they're not going to come and read it, you know, again. It's hard to get traffic uh, continually to the website, but uh, you can really grow the traffic for that niche blog, which will in turn, you know, grow the traffic for the website, but it gives them a reason to continue to come back as you grow that online community of prospects. So, Michael, I just am curious, you know, I don't know how many agency owners are as impatient as me or if that's a typical thing. But, you know, for us to try and niche down um, from a velocity perspective, um, you know, you mentioned how it's a tremendous amount of inbound, which is our ultimate goal. We do not want to have to prospect ever again, if at all possible. But if we, we do have outbound efforts. And so have you noticed how anyone has grown their blog quickly? or at least the followers for their blog 
um, with some sort of secret or, you know, some sort of, I don't know, uh, really great strategy or tactic? Well, when I'm working with an agency, we do a full day workshop where I share with them the strategies, tactics and tools so that they kind of understand where we're going. And we're all on the same page. And the afternoon, in about two and a half hours, we have the positioning exercise, which everybody gets really nervous. Like, we haven't figured out our positioning in years. How are we going to do it in a two and a half hour period? But I guarantee you, you know, I've, I've done this with so many agencies. We've never failed to walk away with a great positioning. And with a very specific target, that's actually where I start in the conversation. The first thing we do is identify the target. And they're trying to be as broad as they can be. And I'm helping them to be much more narrowly focused than they've ever dreamed possible. But again, with it being offsite, it allows me to do that. Now, when I'm working with agencies, most are pressed to generate new business as quickly as possible. So what I have them do is, you know, we've got to develop a a system for content creation. So I put them on a very strict uh, writing schedule of 30 posts in 30 days. Every problem possible is going to pop up. Every challenge to time management is going to come up during that period. And we've got to create a workaround. But what I try to do is to develop strategies and tactics in mind of the chaotic nature of an ad agency. You know, when you go in at nine and it's five o'clock and where did the day go? And and to help them uh, to be able to be consistent because when you're starting to generate leads, that's not the time to step on the brake. That's the time to step on the accelerator. And most agencies... Uh, they are, they really suck at business development. I mean, the vast majority. What other common trait most agencies have is that they're very good at taking care of clients. So when they generate an opportunity for business, most of the focus then shifts to that new client and they forget about business development. Now, all of us have clients we'd like to trade out. So you never want to shut the pipeline off. You want to continue. But to help them accelerate that, when we do those 30 posts, we develop that niche blog so that it it, it has the appearance of age. That prospective client's going to think that they stumbled upon it. Like most agency owners would tell me, you know, I've been following you for years. I don't know how I initially found you, but I know how they found me. You know, I've got a strategy. I utilize tactics so that they can't help but find me. And I've been a cold caller for, you know, uh, most of my ad career until uh, I lost my own consultancy. And in 17 years, I've never made a cold call for any business. And I used to do 75 to 100 cold calls a day. But the dynamic of that relationship is so different when a prospective uh, client initiates the call to you, you own that relationship. Because they already perceive you as being the expert and there's a trust there. You can charge a higher premium because of that positioning. But when they come to that niche blog and it has the appearance of age, one of the ways that we generate traffic to the site initially is just to get an email database specific to that target. That's why I tell them, you know, if you can't go to a list broker and Clearly identify who your target is. You're not where you need to be. You've got to drill down even more so, so that you you can walk away. Like um, one client, automotive manufacturers or, or parts manufacturers is one of their key clients. And so they could go out and actually get a database of 600 companies that are located in a half a day's drive from their agency in Ann Arbor. And because they're near Detroit, uh, they're kind of in Mecca for that niche. And that would then jumpstart traffic to their uh, niche blog very quickly. Uh, Had an agency that was focused on um, 
car dealerships. And they had a list initially of like 23,000 email addresses of the dealership owners or the uh, general managers of the dealerships. And they started generating a lot of traffic very early on. You're also developing um, community building online, but it's not the agency's account that's going to generate much traffic or really any engagement. It's your personal account. But it's like that dealership owner. You don't go to the Lions Club meeting and start handing out brochures. You know, you're showing digital photos of your family or your golden retriever or whatever. You're building relationships because why? People want to purchase something from a person they know, trust, and like. And this accelerates that opportunity to get very personal and build your personal social media accounts around that community of prospects, not just in LinkedIn, but also in Twitter and uh, also with um, even Facebook, which a lot of owners really are reluctant to do that. But it's the most personal platform out there. So a lot of what I post in Facebook, I'll also post in LinkedIn and Twitter, but I want to build that community just as well. And so between two Twitter accounts, I have right at 100,000 Twitter followers. We've got close to, I think, 13, 14,000 connections on LinkedIn. It allows my content to be shared and reshared through that community as I built that up over time. And there's a number of very tactics that you can utilize to start building your online community. But one of the quickest ways is just through the email newsletter. And we take the content that we've created on the niche blog, and we might have like two posts in a newsletter template that looks very similar to the niche blog. It has specific calls to action in the sidebar. You've got a with the two articles, the title, a subtitle, a synopsis, and a link to read more. You want to get that traffic to the niche blog site. You can even uh, it takes about 15 minutes to, to do the newsletter, which is really no time hardly at all. If you send it out like this week, the next week, you can download a, a list of those who didn't open it. You can move the post in the second position up to the top and utilizing that post title as the subject line of the newsletter, resend it to those who didn't open the first and you get almost the same uh, click through and open rates as you did on the initial newsletter. So it took five minutes to set that one up. So it makes it very, very uh, time efficient. And then, you know, you can have someone helping to build your online community of prospects. Like in LinkedIn, they have suggestions of people for you to follow. As you click on those, like if you click on those owners of hardware stores, the built-in algorithm with LinkedIn will start suggesting more and more profiles of those who are in that vertical. So it, it, it actually helps you. And then it varies by account of the number of connections you can make in a day um, through LinkedIn. But as long as you make that request, I find that particularly in LinkedIn, about 80% of those that that you ask for a connection are going to connect with you. But you've got to have somebody consistently doing that to continue to grow that account. Twitter is much the same way. When you follow somebody, they have a tendency to follow you back. We used to have tools in the early days, and I'm hopeful that uh, Elon Musk will bring some business, uh, a business mindset back to Twitter because in the early days, a lot of marketers were wanting to reach their target audience. There were a number of third-party tools that allowed us to do that. I could almost guarantee a client, we can build you additional followers of 1,000 to 1,200 a month. But then Twitter started eliminating all of the tools, tools that we were paying for that they could purchase, you know, the company and do it themselves. But it, it was great back then for community building. Today, it's a little harder. And as you probably are aware, social media is pay to play. 
But as Bob Hoffman, our ad contrarian friend, is part knows, you know, if you waste a lot of money paying social media to boost, you know, your ads. But what I found that works is when you start seeing content that becomes more and more viral, the audience is telling you through your website traffic, this particular post is resonating. I would be confident in then taking that post and maybe paying to have it boosted even more with some specific calls to action, identifying clearly the author and also additional content with links that would generate traffic back to the site. I have no problem with paying some specifics uh, like that to help enhance traffic back to the website. Wow. That is an encyclopedia of market position information right there, Michael. Let's go to the lightning round. All right. Rand, three questions. What do you got? Three questions for Michael. Three questions for Michael. The lightning round. Got it. Oh, geez. You put me on the spot. I know I did. That's a good question. Because he covered a lot of ground. Well, let me ask you a question real quick then, Rand. Michael's talking about a personalized blog. Are you doing that? Are you writing your own? Or are they coming out of Mountain Mojo? Uh, right now, they're coming out of Mountain Mojo because our primary target is the marketing person for the store itself. And so I have the mar- our marketing team you know, looking at wins that we have for our stores and then sharing that with them. Um, so that's where our strategy is a little bit different mostly because I've wanted to get out of the way of our agency for quite some time, but now Michael's kind of re-inspired me to potentially see how, you know, mostly through retention, longevity, that we all know that I'm going to be here for a long, long time of trying to figure out how I might be able to get into the middle of that positioning strategy. Yeah. And most agency owners, they're so busy. They actually need, like you've already have a team that's helping with a lot of this, but they're doing a lot of things on your behalf. I find that trying to build a positioning of expertise around a team is is very hard and a lot of times almost impossible. Usually it's around a person or person. Uh, Mashable, for instance, has been a big resource for a number of people for a very long time. And I'll often ask, can you name an author? And they can't even remember the author. They just know Mashable's a resource. Uh, 85% of those who read content online can't even identify who the author of the content that they read is. And so, it, you know, it takes it, it takes something to really start building that positioning of expertise and usually around that person because you want that person out there speaking those speaking opportunities that you glean, like events with hardware, if you start generating those opportunities, you're instantly recognized as an expert just by being at that event and, and being one of the, the speakers or, or the keynote speaker for the event. Uh, you know, there's a, a, also, good, a good point yeah. to that, Michael, really quick. Sorry to interrupt. Is you had mentioned Jeff Fromm earlier. He yes. was one of your first customers. And mm-hmm. you helped him develop the very first position around millennial marketing. And he became the go-to speaker on millennial marketing. And when is this? 2010-ish? 2008-ish? Something like, like that. that. But Jeff, actually, he purchased a niche blog written by a Harvard professor on millennials. And he owns millennialmarketing.com. And they passed the baton. You know, it, it wasn't anything where, you know, here's here's Jeff. They clearly passed the baton of ownership from one to the other, but it gave him something like 400 posts that kind of had a basis for that. But when Jeff and I were talking, he said, you know, I don't know a thing about millennials other than I've got three of my own. <laughs> yeah. But today, I mean, Jeff's been quoted in Newsweek and Time. He's been on the national news broadcast, anytime there's something about millennial marketing, Jeff's one of the go-to persons. And then we were at Content Marketing, uh, the Content Marketing Institutes, and both of us speaking. 
And Jeff was telling me that, you know, his speaking engagements have grown internationally. He was generating almost a six figure income uh, that, you know, it, of course, went to the agency, but just speaking and the agency was fine with him doing that again, because of all of the perspective op- uh, client opportunities that came through those speaking engagements. But it's one of the few where I know where speaking actually paid for their business development for the entire agency. I mean, it's just incredible. I had Jeff on the show here. Rand, if you're interested, go to episode number 241. And Jeff shares his whole journey with Michael and what they're doing now well beyond the millennial marketing thing. But yeah, I mean, that was a very, very astute positioning back in the day. Rand, any other questions for Michael? Uh, Are the fish biting? Yet, How, how's how's the fish? <laughs> well, he's talking about our boat and spending time on the boat, which you know I, I love business development. I love my my boat more by making new business easier. It allows me to spend more time on the boat. I was actually on a video conference call with a former CEO of McDonald's, Brad Ball, and uh, I had just thrown up a. a fish hook out in the water with some bait on it and uh, waiting on Brad. It, it, we were, had a set time and I had a little time to kill. So then Brad comes online. We're, we're having this conversation. I'm on the back of the boat and I look at my rod and it's not just doing this. It's bent double. And I'm looking at the rod and I'm looking back at Brad. I do that several times. And I said, Brad, I'm sorry. I've got to take this. And he said, what? <laughs> And Brad watched me reel in a 17-pound catfish off the back of the boat. (laughs) But, you know, when you have an inbound approach to new business and you're creating value, you have a target audience, it allows you opportunities like that where you can develop new business anytime, anyplace, anywhere, and you can maintain awareness 24-7. That's what I love about it. Yeah, now, those depth I, of relationships. We've we've had some uh, some houseboat dealings where we've closed some deals on a houseboat. So that's it's one of those same things. It's yeah. the, the depth of relationships allows allow you to be a little bit more yourself and just kind of cut through all the BS and tell them what you can do. Yeah, you know, it's a, uh, social media is its own vetting tool. And Park and I are good friends. Not just uh, he's a former client, but you know, we've maintained a relationship. That's the way it's been really with all of my clients. And I can't think of a bad relationship. And I think it's because it's a vetting process. I've had a number of people who did not like me. And, you know, you can figure that out through social media. I can't imagine that. And, but see, they never call. And that's why those that you develop that relationship where they know and trust and like you and they're the ones that call it it makes for the kind of prospect that you're looking for that fits within your culture and you create that likability and for those that don't like you they'll never call which is not a bad thing it's usually a good thing yeah All right. Well, let's wrap this up. Now, one thing, Rand, you may or may not know about Michael Gass is that he really sucks at retirement. He told (laughs) me he's retired now for like two years, and all he does is keeps taking on more and more business. So, Michael, where can people find out more about you? Not Uh, that you don't want to retire. (laughs) They can go to the website, fuelingyoubusiness.com, or just Michael Gass, G-A-S-S, michaelgass.com. And then I can attest to your work. It is fabulous, and you're even a better friend. So thank you for coming on the show today, Michael. Great great. to have you here. Great to always be with you, Bart. And Rand, how about you? Where can people learn more about you and the great work you all are doing? MountainMojoGroup.com or HardwareInnovators.com if they want to kind of take a peek at that mastermind model. Then I'm on LinkedIn a lot. So if you ever reach out on LinkedIn and want to connect, I'd love to grab 15 minutes and just chat up whoever it is, learn about their their goals, what their uh, journey looks like. It's one of my favorite things to do. 
And that's exactly where I saw your picture today with you and Austin signing the paperwork on your brand new building. Congratulations again on that. It's really exciting. Fun watching your agency grow the way it's growing. I oh, appreciate it, Park. And thanks for having me on the pod. It was a good time. And Michael, I can't thank you enough for the all those the, the wisdom shares. Oh, so I'm glad to be with you. Good to uh, get to know you too, Green. All right. Thank you all for listening to this edition. Hey, if you liked what you heard, share it around. If you're running an ad agency and you're trying to figure out what your position is, then by all means, share this episode with your team there and see if you can't get a little bit more dialed in. If I can help you with your storytelling around your brand and or with your clients, come on over to thebusinessofstory.com. If you have yet to take the ABTs of Agile Communications course, you're going to want to do that right now. You're going to find that at, AB, at businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. And the one thing that I'd like to share at the very end of this is because of Michael's work, he came in and helped me with the positioning of Park & Co. And we had a lot of success with that. But the one thing that it really taught me is that I didn't want to be in the ad agency world anymore, even as well positioned as we were. So everything that I learned from Michael in the positioning of our agency, I have used in the positioning of the business of story. And I can tell you, I ran my agency for 20 years and the clients that I get to work with today, while I had really great clients there, they were all very localized businesses and we could never, ever get the attention of the big boys, the ones that we really wanted to be working with. And now, again, because my positioning and the work that I'm solely doing around business of story, we are working with the likes of the Home Depot. Sorry about that, Rand. You've got some competition. The big guys <laughs> out there going against, doing a ton of work there. We're doing a ton of work with Walmart Canada, training their associates how to use storytelling. Um, the U.S. Air Force, I've been out to Washington, D.C. I can't tell you how many times working with generals. You can add to that Dell, Intel, and even though I'm sounding like a very braggadocious dude right now, I kind of am because those were the kinds of accounts that I was looking to work on. I was having a hard time doing it from Phoenix, Arizona until I got super focused on something that I'm dearly passionate about, and that is helping people connect using the power of story. So again, Michael, I don't think you even begin to realize the impact you have had on me, my business and my family and all of those people I get to serve now around the world because I've got that singular focus. So thanks for that. And uh, for all of you, join us again next week when we'll have some more amazing story artists right here for you. And until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make sure that's a great one. Thanks so much for listening.